Saturday, Lord, we bring them unto you, Father. Father, I just want to bring anything that's distracting us right now, anything that's on our mind, any baggage, Lord, we want to lay them at the foot of the cross. We want to bring them to you, Father, that's so that today we see nothing else but your Son, Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, perhaps every week we always talk about um, the cross. Every week we talk about almost the same thing, salvation and in it kind of seems like a routine. It kind of, kind of seems like week in, week out, we're doing the same thing. But let us be reminded by what Paul says. He says, For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you, except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We know nothing except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So that this morning, as we would give our praise and worship to the servant king, give him the praise that his... Um, Jew, and that we um, bring our lives onto him. And uh, there's this new uh, bridge that's added to uh, an old song called The Servant King that I'd like um, us to learn. And then when we come to that part that we, bring, uh, we sing the bridge, we can sing along. So it's The Servant King is an old song, but uh, we're going to learn a new bridge to it. Okay? We bring our lives to you. We're doing this morning. We bring.
servant king. You are the servant king. The straps whose sandals you're not worthy to untie. You are the glorious one. You are the definition of goodness. But we look unto you, the example, our role model, how to serve. For you are good. You are good. You are love. You are love. You are our hope. You are our hope. You are our peace, and you are our peace. Amen. I will say Jesus. 
of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world forever reign. I'm running to your arms. I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world forever Your grace is more than enough. As we stand here, Lord, we want to be soaked in your grace, be soaked in your mercy. Father, this week, Lord, forgive us when we have sinned against you and others. We have not done what we're supposed to do, and we keep doing what we're not supposed to do. And Father, Lord, we know that as we stand in your grace and mercy, Lord, we are made new. As we stand in your grace and mercy, Lord, we are clothed by your righteousness. Not something that we can attain, not something that we can achieve, not something that we can earn. But Lord, it's something that you've given us as a gift. I want to thank you. Thank you and to praise you with our songs. You're worthy of praise.
And Father God says, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Being still is a discipline of the heart. Being still takes a while before we can let go of everything and just come right into his presence. Being still means not having any other focus except one alone, which is our God. Being still opens up our ear to hear what the Holy Spirit has to say. Being still means not running so that our God can love us and put his arms around us. Being still means not rushing around trying to solve problems in our own way, but to open our eyes and open our eyes and look unto him who is the author and the perfecter of our faith. Being still is a place where we can worship him with all our hearts. Father God, help us to be still before you today. Help us to be still before you today. Help us to know that you are the God that can give us peace. Help us to know that you are the God that quiets our heart, just like a parent quiets the fretting child, that you are the one that quietens down our heart so that we can rest in you, so that we can once again regain that trust to know that, Lord, you are the author and perfecter of our faith. You are the giver of life. You are the one that holds us in the palm of your hand. You are the one that we can hide under in your shelter. For the word of God says that, you know, blessed is the person who dwells in the shelter of the Almighty. There is such a rest in there. There is such a great strength in there. There's such peace and stillness in there. So today, church, we are still before the Almighty God. Be still and know that I am God. Hallelujah. Amen. I want to welcome each one of you to our Sunday service. It is, the, I'm, it is of great delight that I want to welcome our newcomer, Angie's neighbor. <laughs> And not Angie's neighbor, it's me, Angie's friend. <laughs> and um, we, we really welcome you. And we hope that you will stay for a cup of tea later on and get to know uh, our church and that you may find that this will become a spiritual home for you too. And uh, is there anyone else that is new here? I know that the uh, youth had a wonderful time yesterday in Mini Pulse. I know that um, you were worshipping God in a, an environment whereby you danced and you sang and you um, see how you can worship God with your whole being. It's, it's great. Uh, our pastor Chow is in Canada at the moment on holidays. We must remember him. Uh, also, there's a mission team in Greece as well. They're over there. And wherever we are at, we know that God will meet us where we are. We are. So I want to welcome you to our service and remember that next Sunday is a Holy Communion. Let us prepare our hearts to know that it is with great sacrifice that God has given his life for us so that we can partake in this meal with him together and that we look forward to him coming back again. Um, uh, there's a midterm party uh, starting at 5.30 to 8 next Saturday. Uh, there are fun and games for the children. <coughs> there are food and refreshment available. There is a talk for the parents starting at 6.40. And also children who are age 9 and under, there is a dressing up competition. Okay? So dress up in your princess's clothing. Dress up in your Superman clothing. Uh, nothing scary. <laughs> so... Uh, We'll, yes, we want to pray for the mission team there in Greece as well, uh, for the salvation that's there. And uh, also for the cell group, on the 3rd of November, there is a cell group meeting 
uh, at 7.30 on Tuesday in town, and also for the, uh, and on the 5th of November for, for the, the leadership. Okay, so let's pray. Father, we thank you for, um, you are our God. Thank you that you are, we, um, you hold our lives together. Father, we, uh, as a church, we want to pray for the mission team that is in Greece at the moment. Father, speaking about your message of hope, uh, of salvation uh, to the Chinese people in Greece. Father, we pray that, Lord, that, that you give them the word of knowledge. Father, for prophetic word that will be able to reach the heart of the people. Father, we pray for, uh, for the mission team that's there. That, Lord, that their harvest will be plentiful. Father, we rejoice with them when one person turned to you. Uh, Father, we commit them into your hands. Father, we pray um, also for, we thank you for Pastor Chu and uh, Simo Chu who had been with us. Father, blessing us so richly with their lives. Father, continue for this time that, Lord, that you prepare the hearts of people who are listening to, uh, to them. That, Lord, they will truly uh, be able to um, take your word and build our lives on your foundation. Father, we remember Pastor uh, Chow in Canada at this time. Father, give him a refreshing time. Give him greater insights into what you want to do in his life and for this church. Father, we commit this time into your hands. Father, this is your time. And we pray that, Lord, that you be pleased uh, with, with our, our, our sacrifice uh, to you in our, um, in our praise, in our attention, but also in our offering. Father, may you be glorified in all that we do. There's a time for taking our offering now, and it's an offering, it's a, it's a privilege to be able to participate in God's kingdom's work. It is a, as God has provided so richly for us, that in respond to him, we want to give to him. If you're a visitor today, do not feel compelled to give, um, and God delights in a cheerful giver.
Father God, as you have sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to die for us as an expression of your love, Father, thank you for providing so much for us in our lives, that as it overflows from us, that we give our offering to you. Father, thank you for letting us participate in your kingdom. Thank you that you've given us so much that we can serve. Father, I pray that you delight in the offering that we give you, and that may you multiply it for your kingdom's sake. Father, help us to continue to learn how to love. Father, the greatest calling that you have called us is to love one another and to lay down our lives for one another. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. May you delight in our love for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite Eva up for scripture reading, and then after that, we'll give the time to Elder Hoy. So, in chapter John, chapter John, chapter thirteen, verse one to seventeen, so it was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he, know, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal went, was being served, and the devil had already pumped Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come down God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off took off his outer clothing and wrapped um, a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have, no, you have no part with me. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, A person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going, up, who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked him, you call me teacher and the Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also, wash, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master nor is a messenger greater than one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them.
just want to say thank you. Thank you for this morning. Thank you to, for bringing us into your house so that we can be humble and we come before you and listen to your word. Lord, open our hearts so that we can listen. Lord, open our eyes so that we can see what you have done for us. Lord, I commit myself and everyone in this room into your hands and may your spirit speak to us powerfully today in Jesus' name. So today we're going to talk about feet. Not a pleasant topic to talk about. So the topic is something got to do with feet. And Jesus watched the disciples' feet during his final night on earth. Every two years, our family usually go back to Hong Kong. I'm sure you roughly do the same. You go back to Malaysia or you go back to Singapore or Taiwan to visit your friends and relatives. So in the past 15 years, and I discovered that every time I go back to Hong Kong is exactly the same, which is during the last night, the final night of our stay in Hong Kong, we always eat with our family, which is our gran my, my grandpa, grandma, my mother, and a few others. So during the last night of the visit, we always eat with the family. And meeting anyone else that night is out of consideration. I'm sure you do the same during your last night of your stay in Hong Kong or Singapore or Taiwan or Malaysia. You will always eat with your family. Why? Why do we always eat with our families during our last night? Either on holiday or either you go somewhere for visitations or during a youth retreat. The stuff you do last night is always special. Eating dinner with a friend during the night, during the weeknight is different from eating with a dinner during your last night. There's certainly a big difference between the two dates. I repeat again, eating dinner on a usual night is totally different from eating a dinner with the same friend during the last night. Why is it different? Because the last night represents what is important, what is priority in your life. So meeting any of my friends during last night in Hong Kong is out of my consideration because it represents what is important to my heart, what is dear to my heart. It represents the people who I'm seeing, who are they in my life. So I always meet my grandpa and grandma and my mother for dinner in the last night. And here we come John 13. It is the same last night things happen in the last night. In the Gospel of John chapter 13, Jesus is experiencing or going through his final light of his life before he suffers and dies on the cross. And I don't know about you, but when I'm leaving someone, say someone you like from Hong Kong or from anywhere, if I know that I'm leaving them in a few days or in the coming week, my heart don't feel well. I feel like vomiting. This is my, my, my physical reaction that when I have to leave someone I, I really love, I feel like I want to vomit all the time. That's why at the airport, in most of the time, you see that I want to, I want to vomit. And you can see that my eyes are kind of, kind of wet-ish, kind of wet. I'm not crying, but because from all those thingy, that I, this is just me. Before I leave someone that I dearly love, I feel like vomiting. And tonight, Jesus, is feeling the same. Or even though scripture didn't say he feels like vomiting, but certainly Jesus was sick that night. Jesus is not feeling well. His heart is not feeling well because he knows that in the next two days or next coming day, he will have to face the cross. And he is going to leave someone he dearly loved. As John chapter 13, verse 1 already said, when he loves someone, he will love them to the end. He doesn't just love them halfway and give up. He will go all the way. He loved them all the way to the end. So Jesus knew that in 24 hours, he would be dead. His spirit was heavy. And we can see that. And we can see that later on in the night, when he's praying in the garden, he was sweating. And the sweat is as big as the blood drop from his body. So Jesus is not feeling well that night. And in verse 2 it says, 13 men, 12 disciples, and Jesus, 12 and 113, they gather 
in a room, and supper was about to be served. And twelve of them didn't know this is the last supper with Jesus. And obviously, Jesus knew this is his final meal on earth. But he's the only one who knew about this. So back in those days, it is common to wash people's feet before they eat. I don't know why they wash their feet instead of washing their hands, because we use hands to eat. We don't use our feet to eat. So, but it seems to be common back in those days that you wash your feet, and it is usually carried out by the lowest of the lowest servant of the house. And you can understand why. And have you ever experienced this in a dinner, that you're invited to someone's house for dinner, or you're invited to some place for dinner, and the, 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 the host cook a lot of lovely food on the table, and they smell nice, they look nice, and, and everything is ready on the table, and you're kind of ready to, to jump in and eat the fish or the, the, the sweet and sour chicken or whatever is on the table. And I experienced this before, actually a good few times. And just before we eat, someone, and there is always someone who has quietly slipped off their shoes underneath the table. And the smell of feet kind of leak by your side and goes all the way up to your nose. Because there's a gap between your body and your table, right? And there's this feet underneath. And there's smell floating up from the table. And it's kind of embarrassing. That I want to know who is it like? Who took, off the, who took off your shoes? Please put it back on. But it is inappropriate to look under the table. Because you shouldn't do that, right? You shouldn't look under a dining table. So I never really got an opportunity to see, like, who is it that who always <laughs> quietly sleep off their shoes before they eat? Like, this is kind of ruined the whole meal. You kind of smell feet the whole way. And whatever, whatever you eat, you feel like you, you're licking toes for the whole meal. So it, it ruined the whole thing. And the joy kind of disappears. And every time you eat, you, you have this feet smell, like, around you on your chest area. This is not nice. And all right, let's go back to scripture. And this is probably why, <laughs> back in those days, it is good to wash their feet before they eat. Like, I know that everyone today is relatively clean. That we take shower every day, we change socks every day, but not so in the upper room, not in the room where people are sitting back in those days, especially when the weather is quite warm in Israel, in Jerusalem, it's quite warm. And there's no air conditioning in the room. And you have 13 pair of feet that walk for the whole day. And if these people, because they normally have to take off their sandals before they go into the house, so they're not just quietly slip off their shoes, but they, this is one of their customs that they have to take off their shoes before they walk into the door and sit on the table. So imagine that 13 of these feet, or 26 of these feet sitting around and before you eat, this is not nice. So I know why. They always wash their feet before they eat. I'm sure they, they wash their hands as well, like this is basic hygiene, right? But the Bible didn't say, but I'm sure they wash their hands and their feet. But Jesus, the creator of the universe, the king of kings and the lord of lords, he washed 24 of those dirty feet, as Eva just read in the scripture. This is a, this is a piece of scripture that everybody knows. In the past 20 years, as a Christian, I probably heard about this preaching or this story or this illustration of serving one another with humbleness, using Jesus, washing people's feet. I probably heard it 50 times or 80 times in my life. So Jesus was washing these 24 feet before they eat. In verse 4 to 5, Jesus got up and took off his jacket and wrapped a towel around him, and he kneeled down before each one and washed their feet. All the filth and all the dirt from all the 24 feet, are all washed away gently by Jesus. But remember in Colossians chapter 1 and 17, it says, He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. God is before all things. He is the creator of the universe. In one of the songs we just sung, it says, Jesus just cast stars into the universe. It is the same pair of hands that is washing the 24 smelly and filthy feet before they eat. It is the same pair of hands that is holding the universe that is washing their feet. And it is the same pair of hands that will soon be pierced through by long nails. There will be, will be a hole in it. And he showed the disciples there's a hole in his hands. It is the same pair of hands that washed 
the same 24 filthy feet. This is the king we are serving. This is the God we are believing. However, this passage is not just about humbly serve one another. I heard most of the people, when they teach this passage, one of the main theme is to serve one another with humbleness. If this is all this passage is about, you have missed the essence of John 13, 1 to 17. This passage is not just about be humble and serve one another. It is much more than that. But I promise you, there's no one word from God that do not carry a power. If you're willing today to come before God, He will change you. And He will change you right now, today, right here. And let's be humble. And all we have to do is to listen and to pay attention. Jesus understood that in a few short hours, all those 24 feet that were cleansed would soon abandon him. All 24 feet will run and will flee from him. Jesus was washing the feet of a bunch of people who will hurt him, who will sin against him, and who will turn their backs from him. This is what Jesus is doing. When Jesus is washing their feet, he already knew about how and when each one will turn away from him. He knew that in his heart when he's washing their feet. Of course, none of the disciples can see this is coming. Only Jesus knew this is coming. Jesus kept this pain all to himself. He didn't say to the disciples, all of the feet I'm washing tonight will run away from me. He didn't say this to them. He kept it to himself. He kept the whole pain to himself, and he continued to wash his feet. I'll give you an example, one of these movies I watch, right? This girl already knew the boy is cheating on her. And on the night of the boyfriend's, the cheater's, the, the, the birthday, the girl, was, the girl is baking a cake for him. And in the process of baking that cake, she's kind of crying. And she's kind of feeling very sad. And her heart is, is hurt because she knew that the boyfriend has cheated on her. And eventually, the boy will leave her and go to this another girl. But on the night of the boy's birthday, she is still baking a cake for him. But obviously, the boy didn't know. The first girlfriend knew about the second girlfriend. So when the first girl is baking away, she's crying. And the boyfriend came into the house, and she cooked him a lovely meal, and she brought her a birthday cake. She sang, her, sang him birthday songs. Imagine how she's going through all that in that night. She's doing a lot of stuff. She's humble. She's loving. She is serving and sacrificing for the boy. But she's also sacrificing and spending her time on someone who is not faithful to her. Imagine how that night will go. This is exactly the same when we see this is happening on Jesus. Jesus knew the whole 24 feet will run away. There won't be even one pair of feet that will stay by his side to support him. The whole 24 feet that he washed will run away. This is why in verse 7, Jesus said, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will know. If all he's doing is just the washing of the feet, and obviously as a normal human being, you will know he is washing your feet. But in verse 7, Jesus said, what I am doing now, you do not understand. But you do not understand what? The disciples didn't understand what? They should be humble and serve and wash one another's feet? No, this is not what they didn't understand. Because in verse 14, it says clearly, then I set an example to you. Jesus says, I give you instructions. I am your teacher. I am your Lord. And I wash your feet. And you should follow me. So in verse 14, it says extremely clear that you should wash one another's feet. So in verse 7, it says, you do not realize what I am doing. What is Jesus talking about? 
you do not realize what I'm doing. Certainly, this is not about the washing of the feet and be humble and to serve one another. So what does Jesus mean in verse 7 by you do not understand what I'm doing now, but later on, you will know. What Jesus is saying is, I know you will turn your back from me and sin against me, but I'm willing to forgive you. I'm willing to forgive your sin. I'm willing to wash away all the filth and all the dirt of your sin so that you can reconcile with me. Certainly, this is a very sad last night. If you have to go to that night, if you are Jesus that night, this is like a really sad love story that he is presenting. He is loving someone. Twelve of them, not even one stay behind. All twelve disciples, they all run away. One hang himself on a tree. This is very sad. This is not what you expect to happen before you die. If you're in Hong Kong, if you're in Malaysia, if you're in Singapore or Taiwan, you just call someone you dearly love on your last night, and you want to eat with them, and you want to show your love to them, you want to spend time with them. But it turns out that in the next day, they all run away from you. When you're in need, they turn their backs from you. They all betray you. They're gone. They're all gone. For all the love and the time and all the investment you put in, not even one of the 12 disciples stay with him when he's on the cross. This is certainly not something that you are expecting before you leave Hong Kong or Malaysia or Taiwan. But tomorrow night, let's back to the future or fast forward to the future. Imagine that you're these disciples, your, wish, your, your feet just got washed. And Jesus said, you don't know what I'm doing right now. But tomorrow night, you will understand that Jesus washed my feet. He washed my feet last night. And the real meaning is, he forgives and cleanses me from my dirt. This is why Jesus said in verse 10a, the first part of 10, those who had a bath need only to wash their feet the whole body is clean. What does that mean? When someone who already took a bath or a shower, that when someone is clean from head to toe already, you only need to wash your feet before your whole body is clean. Having had a bath, meaning that you are already a Christian, that all your sins is forgiven, by Jesus, in the one go. So now you're clean. No more dirt. You're a Christian. You're perfect. In the, in the eyes of God, you had a bath. You're clean. But we, we do sin afterward. So Jesus said, wash their feet and the whole body is clean. What he meant is, washing their feet means God's subsequent forgiveness of our continuous sin. As a Christian, we took a bath already. We are clean. But after we bath, we take a shower, we continue to sin. And by Jesus washing our feet, that means he is forgiving our continuous and subsequent sin after when we become a Christian. This is what Jesus is saying to the disciples. Now, you guys are Christians, but you guys will sin in the near future. In particular, when I'm on the cross, you guys will all turn away from me and sin against me. So what Jesus is saying is, I'm going to forgive you in advance. But none of the disciples knew what he is talking about. And verse 7 said that. But I have a good news for you. Jesus still wants to cleanse people's feet. He still wants to wash your feet. He is still doing that every day. I don't know when or where you have been. We've been out there doing stuff that is not pleasing to God. We've been out there doing stuff that is grieving to God. Just like one of those 24 feet, Jesus washed in his final night. We are covered with dirt and with filth. <laughs> and today, Jesus is willing to remove all the guilt and all the dirt and all the filth from your life and from your feet. Imagine, Jesus now is washing the feet, washing your feet. <laughs> he kneeled down right beside you. He took off his jacket. He put a towel around you and he knew in front of you. 
and he is about to wash your feet, and he's looking into your eyes. And Jesus already knew all the hidden secrets of your life. He can already see what you are doing in your private life. Before he washed your feet, he looked you into your eyes, and he knew. And he knew what's going on in your life. And then he washed your feet. A lot of the times we have this guilt in our heart, thinking that Jesus can just skip, skip me today. Can you just, just go to the next, next one and just skip me for the moment? I'm not ready for you to wash my feet because I know that before you wash my feet, you can see all my hidden secrets. Can you just skip me for, for a moment? Let me go to the back room. Let me pray to the Father. Let, let him forgive my sins. Then I come back and now can you wash my feet after that? So a lot of the times we, we, we have this guilty feeling that, God, I'm unworthy for you to wash my feet. But Jesus continues to wash your feet. Jesus continues to kneel down beside you and wash your feet. We are totally forgiven and we are totally cleansed in the name of Jesus. Jesus washed us knowing that in future we will sin against him and we will betray him and we will abandon him. He knows us better than we know ourselves. He can see it right in our eyes. What's going to happen next? And yet, he believed in us. He put your trust, he put his trust on you. He put his trust on you that he, he, he gives you faith that you can do good. He gives you faith that you can rely on him. He gives you faith that you can overcome all the sins and temptation in your life and go back to him. So by him washing your feet, your feet he demonstrates his faith and confidence in you. And a lot of the times, we don't even have the same faith, we don't even have the same confidence in our lives because we fail many times. But Jesus, no. Jesus said, no matter how many times you fail, I'm still going to wash your feet, I'm still going to cleanse your feet, and you will be good after that. Now imagine for the moment, now Jesus is washing feet <laughs> with the 12 disciples. And say, for example, he just finished, say, the feet of John or Peter or whoever. And now it comes to Judas. I don't know who's sitting beside who. I just make it up. So just say Judas sitting beside Peter. Jesus has just finished Peter's feet. And he knew that Peter would deny him three times before the morning. And yet he still washed Peter's feet. And now he's come to the difficult one, Judas. Jesus just dry all the feet and the toe of Peter. Moving on to Judas. What will you do if you're Jesus? And how do you feel if you're Jesus? Facing Judas in front of you. Now you're kneeling down beside Judas. Am I going to wash your feet or not? Should I be washing your feet or not? Jesus' emotion is hurt. When he kneeled down beside Judas, I'm sure he is crying in his heart. His emotion is hurt. He knew that this pair of feet will walk to that hanging tree. He knew that Judas will commit suicide in a day. He knew that Judas, this pair of feet, he just washed, he just cleansed, will walk to the hanging tree. So what should I do now? Should I continue to wash his feet? Jesus is prepared to forgive Judas. Oh, 100%. He is ready to forgive Judas. But Judas is not prepared to forgive himself. That is the issue. Jesus is, for, Jesus is ready to forgive Judas. But Judas is not prepared to forgive himself. That's why later on in the day, he hung himself on that tree. And he fell from the tree and hit a rock. And the whole belly just burst. And everything came out. That's in the scripture. I didn't make it up. He killed himself on the hanging tree. Jesus already saw all these when he's washing Judas' feet. He washed Judas' feet, knowing that in future he has plans to harm him. Because Judas is also the one who betrayed Jesus for 30 coins. For money, he betrayed Jesus. 
he told the Roman soldiers, where is Jesus, so that the soldiers can come and get Jesus and put him on the cross. Jesus, when he washed Judas' feet, knowing that this is the last night he will see Judas, he must, his feelings, his emotions must be very complicated. For the other 11 disciples, he knew that he would turn away from him, but at least he would see them again. He will resurrect in three days, and he will show himself to the disciples and have dinner together. But Judas will kill himself, and Jesus will never see him again. And yet, he still washed his feet. He continued to wash his feet all the way to the end. First one said what? First one said, for all the one Jesus loved so dearly, he will love them to the end. This is loving Judas to the end. This is what first one is talking about. Jesus is loving us to the end. Brothers and sisters, God is amazing. Can you see what he just did? He washed Judas' feet. And this is what Jesus is asking the 12 disciples to do later on in the passage. Jesus didn't just ask you, hey, Christian, be humble and serve one another and wash one another's feet. This is not just what Jesus is asking Christian to do. In verse 14, it says, Now that I, I, your Lord and teacher, has washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. Jesus does not just ask us to serve one another with humbleness. He is asking us to wash somebody's feet. And who is this somebody? Somebody who is dirty and filthy. Somebody who, who hurt you. Somebody who wrong against you. Somebody who hurt you and betray you. And now Jesus in verse 14 said, Christians, now you have to wash this somebody's feet. As we have been freely forgiven and by God, we will have no choice but fill with God's love and forgiveness so that we can wash the Judas of our lives, so that we can wash his feet. Jesus is inviting us to be Christ-like, Christ-like to be willing to forgive and to love to the end. Later on in that weekend, when Jesus died on the cross, every hope seems to disappear. Now Jesus is gone. Jesus has died. Perhaps these 11 disciples, as I said, one died already. Judas is dead. The 11 disciples probably have experienced the longest night of their life. The, the, the 12 hour night feels like 12 months. They, have, they are experiencing the longest nights of their entire life. They are hopeless men sitting around, staring at the ground, don't know what to do. Jesus was dead. Their savior, their hope, they are expecting Jesus would turn into a general leading an army to fight the Romans and win the, the, the country back. And now he's dead. Their general is gone. He's dead. As they stare, I wonder if they happen to notice their feet. I think so. When they are staring around, they will see their feet. Because Jesus, in verse 7, said, Later you will understand. When they are staring around, and for some reasons, their feet is catching their attention, they will remember that last night, Jesus washed my feet. They will all remember, and they will all know what Jesus had really done in their lives. Even though their feet are dirty once again, even though they have abandoned him, but Jesus wa want them to understand. And now they truly understand. Even before Jesus died, they were forgiven. Our God is just amazing. Our God is just powerful. <laughs> Jesus has forgiven us ahead of time. God has forgiven us even before we sin. He did it to the disciples, and he did it to you today. We were forgiven before we even ask. Mercy and grace is demonstrated even before we realize we need this mercy and grace. Jesus washed 
the disciples' feet. And Jesus is washing your feet today. This is the kind of God He is. He gives us the power to be a little cleaner as the, gate, as the days goes by. He gives us power to be a little more Christ-like day by day. Our goal is to be Christ-like. At the meantime, we know that we are forgiven. And now you have the power to wash not just one another's feet, but you also have the power to wash Judas' feet. This is what John is talking about. It doesn't just invite you to be humble and to serve one another. Jesus is inviting you to be Christ-like. Jesus is inviting us to be like him. And Jesus is inviting us to wash the feet of our enemies. Brothers and sisters, let's pray. Let's be humble and come before God. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for washing my feet today, knowing that I will turn away from you. Thank you for your demonstration of grace. Thank you for your demonstration of mercy, even before we realize we need this grace and mercy in our lives. Dear Father in the heaven, thank you for washing our feet. And now I pray that you would wash not only our feet, but our heart with your blood in the name of Jesus. Let's sing this song and respond to God's word. Your grace is in me, Jesus lights the way. By the power of your word, I am restored, I am redeemed. By your spirit, I am free. Red. 
Before we can come to you and bow down before your throne. Thank you for what you have done in our lives so that we can be more Christ-like. So that we will have the heart to follow you, to serve one another, and to wash the feet of the Judas in our lives. Lord, I want to commit all myself unto your hands. Celebrated Holy Spirit, you give me the power to live what I heard today. I want to serve you, Lord. I want to serve brothers and sisters. And I also want to serve the people who hurt me, the people who sin and wrong against me. Lord, give me this strength and power so that I can love them. In Jesus' name we pray. example of how to serve, how to serve with all our hearts. We pray that the love of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit will be with us today, tomorrow, and for the rest of the week until we meet again. May God bless you. May you know that God loves you and he wants to bless your life. In Jesus' name we pray.